We do just want to say happy Mother's Day. Thanks for coming to church today. We know this is a big day for so many. Uh, we know this is also a hard day for so many. So as we gather in church this morning, um, I really wanted to talk about Mother's Day for a minute. I didn't know how long baby dedication would last, and so I put together a sermon that's kind of like build your own conclusion, so we could go 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. We'll just see, right? We'll, just, we'll see how it goes. But when it comes to Mother's Day, I do want to just say just really quickly, I want to say happy Mother's Day. Hear me out just for a second. If you're a mother of one or a mother of 20, there are those. If you're an expectant mom or hope to one day be a mom. If you're a working mom or a stay-at-home mom. If you're a single mom. If you're a stepmom. If you're a foster mom. If you're an adoptive mom. There's a lot more of these than we think. If you're a spiritual mom. If you're a mom of a mom or a mom of a mom of a mom. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for how you pour and you invest, and thank you for all the long days. Thank you for all the time. Thank you for the thankless job that you have. You are seen, not just today, but every day, all day long. And I want to say thank you. We want to honor you. Children are a heritage from the Lord, and we are so grateful that you do what you do. Now, I know, and I want to acknowledge, today can be a really hard day. Today is one of those days that tugs at us. Just so you know, Mother's Day is not found in the Bible. Like We don't celebrate Mother's Day like we do Easter or Christmas. This is a, our culture Mother's Day. But we do want to honor it and celebrate it. We know that it tugs, though. Perhaps there's regret. Perhaps there's guilt that mothers walk with. Perhaps there's heartache from losing a child. Or maybe this is the first Mother's Day that mom isn't here. Um, I just want to acknowledge the hard parts of this day. I want to just speak over you um, 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians 3.16. The writer says this, may the Lord of peace, of the peace himself, give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with all of you, regardless of what circumstance you find yourself today, regardless of what longings you have or guilt or burdens you have in your heart, even if this is the most joyous day you could possibly imagine. I want the Lord of all peace to guard you, to build you up, and for you to be honored. We love you. We're grateful for you. Now, um, we were looking at the times uh, as we were considering Mother's Day. I put together a series, probably back in July, of working through the life of Abraham. Um, I didn't really give much consideration to uh, Mother's Day, um, but as we lined out the life of Abraham, what we'd be coming to today in the text is the death of Sarah. So I thought, let's push pause, <laughs> right? Let's not do that one. <laughs> Uh, let's just not ruin Mother's Day for everybody, but come back next week. It'll be great. <laughs> what I wanted to do today was really in, um, and I'm kind of going off the fly here. I think I've got 20 minutes. In my 20 minutes, I really want to just cast a big vision. I want us to set our sights on what God has for us in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we see a beautiful picture of the family, not only a spiritual family, but also the nuclear family, the ones in the house. And here's what I want us to do. I want us to think in terms of this picture. C.S. Lewis, uh, he said, um, and, I've, and I've always been caught by it, that our children grow in twin gardens. That there are two gardens that our children grow in. And that I think, like, I don't think that illustration's lost on us. And here's why. Um, in 1948, about 48% of Americans uh, grew their own produce. In 2019, 0.8% of Americans grew their own produce in their backyard. And then COVID hit, and all of a sudden, we became experts in global disease and gardening. Like, I don't know how it happened, but all of a sudden, Facebook was blown up with everybody's got their own garden, they're growing things, vegetables, it's organic. Like, I think miracle Grow like, killed it in COVID, right? Like, organic soil. So there is this, all of a sudden, garden kind of thing that started happening in 2020, where everybody's growing their own produce, and now we're starting to understand, okay, here's how things grow. One of the things that's really important for us as families and as a church is how do our children grow? How do they grow? And C.S. Lewis, as he's speaking to this passage, he said, our children grow in twin gardens. There is the garden of the home, and there is the garden of the church. And in these two gardens, our children grow, develop, mature, become all that God has called them to be. And so on Mother's Day, on Baby Dedication Sunday, I wanted to talk about these twin gardens, these two gardens that our children grow in in Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
Now, Deuteronomy chapter 6 is still the same writer that we've been reading. It's Moses. He wrote the Torah. Moses wrote Deuteronomy chapter 6 as they're coming out of the wandering. So this is coming out of the wandering for 40 years, and this is what he's writing to the people of Israel. There are two things that happen in this passage that I think are really helpful. One overarching picture for what happens in our home. Verse 4 is where I'm going to begin. Uh, Miss Jenny, I'm going to start in verse 4 uh, because, we're again, we're building our own conclusion. All right, verse 4 says this. Listen, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words that I am giving you here today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit down in your house and when you walk alongside the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. Now, maybe you've studied this before. Maybe you've seen Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is called the Shema. This is what's been known to, especially if you grew up Jewish, the Shema was something you recited twice a day. It was really interesting, and we don't know exactly how this looked, but there was a leather pouch that was made um, that people would wear, the Jewish people would wear, and this leather pouch would be either on your wrist or on your forehead, which is this, what we're speaking to here, and this leather pouch would have inscribed on it the Shema, this, or inside that pouch written the Shema. And so these Jewish people, as they're growing, they would recite this twice a day. This was to be ever in front of them, always in front of them. And what's being communicated in the Shema is so important for us as families. But be careful. Like, you might be thinking, well, all my kids are out of the house. There's a bigger thing happening here in this passage than just your children. I want to prove that to you in just a minute. But here's what happens. He says, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. This is to be repeated in your life twice a day. Now, whenever it comes to the garden number one, the first garden, the home, I think the win for us as parents, me as a parent, I've got an 11-year-old, a 9-year-old, and a 7-year-old, me as a parent, the win, the it, is this. It's found right there in verse 5. What do we want? I think all of us have probably asked this question of, what do we want for our kids? What do we hope to happen? When we're parenting, we're not just aimlessly going, hoping something happens. I mean, if we kind of think about our culture, we want straight teeth, right? We're probably still paying off that dentist bill right now. We want white straight teeth. We want them to be respectful. We want them to be confident. We want them to have a smooth 12-step McLean golf swing, right? Let's, Let's teach them the fundamentals. It's the Varden grip, right? Like, when it comes to parenting, what is the most important thing? What we see here at the end of the day, it is to point them to Jesus. Like, this is such an important reminder for all of us as parents. We want to point them to Jesus. We want our kids to love the Lord our God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their strength. At the end of the day, when it all comes down to it, I want my children My kids, your kids, the end goal is to love the Lord their God with all of their heart, soul, and strength. Parents, look right at me. This is exactly what we want. There is no other goal for us. There is nothing else that we want. There is no greater purpose in our lives for these three things to be developed in our kids. Number one, the heart. It's interesting in this passage, the original Hebrew language has no word for mind or brain. In fact, whenever it says the heart, it's speaking to both of those. We like to separate the heart and the mind, but it's not. It's together in the Hebrew language. In Merrill's commentary, he says this, The heart is, in the Old Testament anthropology, the seat of the intellect, equivalent to the mind or the rational part of humankind. This integral bringing together of heart and mind Meaning that our faith is not an absence of knowledge. Certainly, the intellect is to be developed. Our heart, that there is something deep in our heart that belongs to the Lord. This is the greatest purpose that we can bring to our children. But their soul, the soul is, is a better word, being, refers to the invisible part of the individual. The person, including the will and the sensibility. So yes, the intellect, that their faith is strong from the intellect and the heart. But it's their will, their emotional well-being. They rely on the Lord, but they don't take everything in their own strength. It's their soul, but also their strength. This is the most obvious to us, certainly. 
the physical side and all of its functions and capacity, that there is action behind their faith. That yes, their heart is transformed, their mind is transformed, there is a will, or there's a soul at their will, but then there's strength. They're moving forward in their faith. It's a holistic approach. Here's how one commentator said it. It's all that is within me. Isn't that the goal of parenting? Isn't that supposed to be the goal of parenting? That in their heart, in their soul, in their strength, that they would love God with everything they have, heart, soul, and strength, that all that is within them. Let me ask you just a quick question. This is not to bring guilt, but is the word of God dwelling in you? Because out of the word of God dwelling in you, that's how you navigate the conversations of heart, soul, and strength. The word of God dwelling in us. Now here's the problem that we can all just agree if you have children. We can't force this to happen. We can't just will this to happen. You can't force it. We create an environment where the Lord is central, where the gospel is central, and we pray, we are people of prayer, that the Lord would open their hearts. These babies that were standing in front of you, we can't save them. Only God can do that. We can put the gospel in front of them. We can love God with everything we have, but only God can save them. And that makes us people of prayer. That as parents, we are people of prayer. God, would you open their hearts? Would you show them who you are? Now, from a practical standpoint, I think there's two ditches that we need to avoid here, okay? This is where it becomes really practical to us. You know how you're going um, on a road, and it's raining? I'm kind of getting older in my eyes, but there's a di- I get really worried about this ditch on the, on the right. But then if you get, on, get over here a little bit further, there's a little, really big ditch over here on the left. When it comes to the Shema, we kind of see here, there's some big words that pop up that are two ditches that we really need to avoid as a church and as parents. Let me tell you the first ditch. I think the first ditch or the extreme is this. I'm just going to let the church teach my kids about God. And here's the deal. I think we have an unbelievable kids' ministry. I think what happens in kids' ministry is spectacular. As we walk through the scriptures every Sunday morning, I believe your kids are growing in knowledge of the Lord, knowledge of what he's done. However, one of the things that we see here in our culture is we like to say, okay, I'm, and we're busy. I know you're busy. It's I'm going to take my son to baseball. They're going to teach them baseball. I'm going to take my daughter to soccer. They're going to teach her soccer. I'm going to take my kids to piano. They're going to teach them piano, right? I'm going to take my kids to school. They're going to teach them everything that they're supposed to learn, right? Or I'm going to homeschool. I'm going to teach them all that. But then I'm going to take them to church on Sunday mornings, and they're going to teach them God. So as long as they're just getting some God an hour a week, maybe then it'll catch, right? But that's a ditch that we have to avoid. Consider the language in this text. They'll just blow your mind for a minute. Repeat them to your children. Whenever you sit down, whenever you walk alongside the road, bind them as a sign on your hand, symbol on your forehead, write them as on your doorpost of your house. This is not speaking to what happens at Herf Elementary. This is what's speaking to at your house, your, uh, your children. When you sit down, when you walk alongside the road, bind them on your hand. These are ours. Here's the point. Here's the big idea. Parents, you are the primary discipler of your kids. You are. There's a reality that I realized whenever we planted the church, that Hebrews tells us that I am going to be, I am going to give an account, listen to this, for your souls. Like this is the most scary passage that I've ever read. Like I'm kind of tired of the church growing, honestly. Like we're putting too many chairs out because I have to give an account for you people, right? Like think about you for a minute. I've got to give an account to God for you. You gotta need to calm down your lives a little bit, right? <laughs> but as parents, we are gonna give an account for our children. Let that weight just be there for a minute. I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable, it's the reality. We are the primary disciples of our children. This is the reality of the scriptures, this is the reality of the whole Old Testament and New Testament, that God has given you your children as a gift to steward. Not your project, not something to make you look better, but a gift to steward. And by the way, he loves your kids more than you do. He does. And he's given you these children as a gift. Now, the first ditch to avoid is, okay, I'm going to let the church just take care of my kids. I don't have to worry about that. But there's another ditch to avoid. And notice whenever you see this passage, it doesn't actually give you a formula. And here's the other passage I want us to consider. A formal Bible study is the only way. That family discipleship, and God bless us, all of us, we're all on Instagram, I think, and what Instagram does is it gives us an unrealistic expectation of what's supposed to to happen in our home. 
Like if you start looking at family discipleship, it's like, okay, we're supposed to have a formal Bible study. We're all supposed to sit down together, sing songs, uh, pull out the Davidical law, right? And just start working through it. I'm going to be honest with you. Like I, I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to do this. And maybe you've tried family discipleship in your home of getting everybody for a Bible study. It's so difficult. I'm just going to put, it's hard. Like for a pastor, like I can sit everybody down. Like, hey, we're supposed to do this. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the prelapsarian Eden, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about the arguments for and against Calvinism, right? And so all of a sudden, my 7-year-old, 9-year-old, 11-year-old is staring at me, right? Somebody's going to toot, <laughs> right? It's all going to explode in her just awesomeness. See, the issue is this. We like to think because of Instagram that it's supposed to be perfect. It's not perfect. As we walk alongside this passage, we see that it says to listen, to love, to talk, to repeat, to bind, to write. This takes down this expectation that family discipleship is a Bible study every morning where we're getting in the Word together. We're kind of, and maybe that's you. Maybe it is. Maybe, you're, maybe your kids are like, awesome, totally fine. But for the majority of us, it's not. It's as you go. Some of the most influential times I have with my kids are in the truck going to baseball, going to whatever recital they have. Like, that's the moment I get to speak into them. This is family discipleship. So I want to put everybody at ease just for a minute. Family discipleship is as you go. It's not this formal moment where we're going to get out Deuteronomy. We're going to all read this. It doesn't go well. Just walk alongside the road. That's why the word of God dwelling with you richly is so important. Okay? So as we consider the twin gardens, we see there's the family that's us. The goal is heart, soul, strength. And the two ditches that we need to avoid as parents is, I'm going to let the church teach my kids about God, and I think we should always have a formal Bible study. That's not it. We're teaching our kids the love of Jesus as we go. Now, garden number two, it's subtle, but it's in the text. Here's what's so cool about it. Garden number two is the, is the church. In all of the great passages of Scripture, in terms of parenting, it always talks about the big tribe, the big tribe of believers. So in this passage, look at this. It says, listen, Israel. It's talking to everyone. This instruction is for everyone. And so even as we're talking about parenting, this is great encouragement to us. Because here's why. Reggie Joyner tells us that every young person needs five additional voices in their lives other than their parents. That your kids need more voices than just you. And that is the truth of the Old Testament that we find as, as Israel's walking. We see the truth in the New Testament that we need more people speaking into our kids' life because we all know this. There comes a time when they just don't listen to us anymore. They just don't. And so then all of a sudden when there's supporting voices that you know that are speaking into your children's life, it's a really big deal. So it's an encouragement to us as parents that this is awesome, that we have more people speaking into our kids than just us. But listen, every person who calls the Bridge Fellowship home, every one of you, this is a great reminder for all of us, that all of us are in the battle together, that all of us are called to walk alongside families. Now, let me just blow your mind for a minute. This is crazy. We have dedicated 49 babies since we started the church. Like, what have you? Okay. Should we clap? I don't know. Like, we haven't even done a series on Song of Solomon. All of a sudden, 49 babies, right? Feel the weight of that for a minute. 49 children, babies, whose families have called the Bridge Fellowship home that we pray for, walk alongside. I'm going to go just another step. 150 baptisms since we started the church. Do you feel the weight of the two words, O Israel, us, listen, Israel? Those 49 babies in a spiritual sense are your babies too. Those 150 people who've been baptized are our family, brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you know that 200 kids show up every Sunday morning to hear the gospel upstairs? 200 kids. So all of a sudden, when we see the Shema, when we hear, listen, Israel, the reality and the weight of that we hold as a church is all of these children we're going to raise up. So today is not baby dedication. Today is church commissioning. This is us, our children, our students. Even consider students. 70 students come every Wednesday night. 
I'm in a really sweet season right now, and don't hear this about me, but I'm in a really sweet season. My job does not allow me to serve and bridge kids. I wish I could. I wish I could just hand the Bible to somebody and be like, take it, right, and go serve and bridge kids. But Meredith's always been able to do that. On Sunday morning, she's been able to do that. She's been walking with our children through bridge kids. Um, we have one graduating out of bridge kids, going to student ministry, and that happens on Wednesday nights. And I, Meredith and I talked about it. I was like, look, now's my time. So last week, two weeks ago, I turned in my application to be a bridge student's volunteer. I put down Meredith as a reference. I put down Jared Carter, <laughs> right? And Travis better call both of them. I'm serious, because we take it so seriously. Now, all of a sudden, I'm not just a guy that talks on Sunday mornings. I'm walking alongside your students with my children. That's the family. That's the church. That's listen, Israel. We're all in this. Nobody's in a place where we don't get to serve. I don't have to serve. I preach on Sunday mornings. <laughs> no, we're in this together. Our children are being raised up for a purpose, and that's to be an arrow. Scripture tells us that we are to pull back that bow and shoot those arrows out, and I want to release arrows into that culture. Like, bring it on. Let's go make a difference in our culture. The twin gardens that our children grow, one is the home. Be very careful. The purpose of parenting is that they would love God with all their heart, soul, and strength. Be careful not to let the, the mindset of, I'm going to let the church teach my kids about God, and then I'll take them to everything else. Or there has to be a formal Bible study all the time. You can release a little bit of pressure there. But also the second garden is the church. That's us. That's you. That's me. That we're raising up the next generation to love God with all they have. That's our goal. Now, uh, there's a whole other part of the sermon, and I think we're out of time, which is great. We'll do that another time. Here's how I want us to end. I want to tell you this. I think our greatest enemy when it comes to parenting, when it comes to the church development of children is this, apathy. I think it's easy for us to allow apathy to come into the middle of it. And here's a couple of things we might say. I'm too tired, and I get it, you're tired. We're all tired. That's why the scriptures always say, God, would you give me strength? I'm tired. You're always tired. I'm always tired. We're going to stay tired till we die. And then we go to eternity. It's going to be awesome. But even then, we're going to be worshiping all the time. Or I don't care. There's a mindset that's like, I just don't, I don't care about all of it. And we have to be careful with that. Or third, I'll let someone else do it. Friends, we're all called here. Every one of us are called to make a spiritual difference in someone else's life. And it happens all the time. Like the chair that you're sitting in was set up by somebody. And that somebody was trying to make a spiritual difference that you might hear the gospel today. The greeters, as you come into the doors, as you find a parking spot, people are serving to make a spiritual difference in someone else's life. You can do it. We can do this. Let's serve our kids. Let's serve our students. Let's, I can't wait to show you what's all going to happen in adult ministries in the next six months. Like It's just amazing to me what God is doing. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. I feel like the Lord is just, we're just scratching the surface of what God's going to do here. I'm not talking numerically. Like, God help us. I don't know that we can fit any more people. But the question is, what do we do with our people? How do we grow here? How do we mature here? That's what I'm so excited about. But we can't be apathetic. We've got to look to Jesus. Why? Why would we do that? Because this does matter. This has eternal consequences. Because here's what we believe, that Jesus Christ is the ultimate hope for every person. And if we truly believe that though we're all sinful and our sin separates us from God, God made a way for us to be in right relationship with him again. That way is Jesus. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And God promises that all who place their faith in Jesus Christ will be saved. That's the good news of the Bible. That's the good news for Mother's Day. That's the good news for us. There's a way that God has made a way. And we want to see a gospel movement that reaches every person, the smallest to the oldest, the youngest to the oldest. Every person matters. So we serve to make a spiritual difference. That's what we're about at the Bridge Fellowship.